Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So, good evening, sir. I'll be leaving the live session soon because of load shedding. I will view the recording. That is 100%. So, I know load shedding has started at a horrible time, but that's no worries. If you have no pro, uh, if you have problems with load shedding, then just key, uh, catch up afterwards with the lecture recording. I try to upload it within an hour after the lecture. So how are you guys? I hope you had a great long weekend. My weekend was also not too bad, it was just sitting and working the same as you guys. Been a long year, we're only in month number five now. So the calculus in these of these looms ever closer when you're writing calculus. Ah, next week, Thursday, and the scope of the work. I assume the scope will be more about differentiation than limits. So let's give another minute or two and see who else joins us. So seeing with calculus coming up and load shedding, class participation this evening will be low. But also a few of you has popped in for consultation sessions today. So it was finally nice to meet you guys in person. So it's nice to finally put a face against the name I'm seeing usually in the chat. So it's nice to meet you guys. In the 12 for WTW, so limits, derivatives, and inverse functions. Ah, limits is horrible work. Derivatives is fun. Inverse functions is not too bad, but I know derivatives, you're probably going to start out with first principles. But that's so this calculus this semester will probably be your most difficult calculus. Module for next semester will be a little bit easier. serve something to you every day for the next 10 days. I know this is now a difficult time and the scary thing is usually there's a schedule by the different faculties so sometimes lecturers don't even have control over when stuff must be due. But remember, if things get too tough and you feel you have too much stuff going on, then usually if your lecturer is not asked, then you can negotiate to reschedule some stuff. So, are you guys still with me where we left off last week's lecture. Awesome. So last week we stopped with active galactic nuclei and quasars. So I left you off with this image. With which eyes do you observe the universe? So here we can see how the same object, and this object is the center of our own galaxy, looks through different telescopes. So the second quiz is a bit harder than the first quiz, and so it's a little bit harder because we covered a bit more work and more detailed work, but as soon as everyone has finished the quiz, then I will go through the memo with all you guys. But remember, you have two attempts to do the quiz. So if something goes wrong, or if you want to improve your mark, you have two, attempt, two attempts. Okay. 
So let's continue on to a new concept called a ciphered galaxy. So this is also a very prominent telescope usually featured in movies, the Mount Wilson Observatory. So 1943, Mount Wilson astronomer Carl Seifert published a study of spiral galaxies. Observing at visual wavelengths, Seifert found that some spiral galaxies have small, highly luminous nuclei with peculiar spectra. These galaxies are now known as Seifert galaxies. So about 2% of spiral galaxies appear to be Seifert galaxies. So something interesting, there's a recent movie where this telescope is portrayed in. You guys, it's featured on Netflix. You guys have any ideas which, which movie is that? So if you have load shedding, don't worry about it. If there's load shedding happens in your connection to Skype, then just um, watch the recording afterwards uh, in your own time. So any idea where this, in the recent movie where this telescope was featured? So this was featured, a little snippets was used in a movie, Don't Look Up. Yes, you are correct, Mr. Rumpards, Don't Look Up. Why was that movie terrible? So, so you actually realize that a lot of people are actually like that across the globe and it's actually denying science. So that's a conversation for a totally different time, but I've dealt with a lot of those people. So here we can see cipher galaxies are spiral galaxies with small, highly luminous nuclei. Some are interacting with nearby companions and appear distorted with tidal, tidal tails and bridges. So I expect something like Armageddon or Deep Impact. My mistake for not knowing much about it before and no worries. But it was still a good movie and it actually portrayed how civilization and people act towards science and knowledge. So the other day I had an argument with someone that says no one can predict the weather, but that's a story for a, another time. So the spectrum of a galaxy is the blended spectra of billions of stars. And consequently, weak spectra lines get washed out. Galaxy spectra contain only a few of the strongest absorption lines found in the stellar spectra. In contrast, spectra of ciphered galaxy nuclei contain broad emission lines. Emission lines are produced by a hot, low density gas. So the gas in the nuclei of the, of the ciphered galaxy must be highly excited. The width of the spectra line suggests that large Doppler shifts produced by velocities in the nuclei. Gas approaching Earth produces blue shift spectral lines, and gas going away produces red shift lines. The combined light of gas approaching and receding, therefore, contains broad spectral lines showing the velocities at the center of cipher galaxies are roughly 10,000 kilometers per second, so about 30 times greater than velocities at the center of normal galaxies. So something violent is happening in the course of ciphered galaxies. The brilliant nuclei of ciphered galaxies fluctuate rapidly, especially at X-ray wavelengths. The ciphered nucleus can change its X-ray brightness by a significant amount in only minutes. 
As you learned when you studied neutron stars, an object cannot change its brightness noticeably in a shorter time than it takes the light to cross its diameter. If the ciphered nucleus can change in a few minutes, then it cannot be more than a few light minutes in diameter, about the size of Earth's orbit. In spite of the small size, the cores of ciphered galaxies produce tremendous amounts of energies. The brightest emit a hundred times more energy than the entire Milky Way galaxy. Lots of energy is produced in a very small volume with extremely high temperatures and velocities. What does that remind you of? Astronomers conclude that the centers of these galaxies contain supermassive black holes orbited by hot accretion disks through which matter is flowing into the black hole. Early in this chapter, you learned about the evidence that most galaxies contain supermassive black holes at the centers. Nevertheless, most galaxies are not erupting. The shapes of ciphered galaxies provide an important clue. About 25% of ciphered galaxies have peculiar shapes, suggesting that they have had tidal interactions with other galaxies. So in image A, we can see a ciphered galaxy, NGC 7674, is part of a compact group of galaxies and is interacting with its smaller companion. So here we can see the cipher galaxy interacting with the normal companion. But if you look at false visual color, and this is now we're looking at a radio image, we can see the tidal tails to the left and upper right are more easily visible in this enhanced image. Something interesting. Can anyone of you tell me what this NGC stands for? Any ideas, any volunteers? Yes, Mr. Pretorius, you are correct. That stands for the new general catalog. So stars are named and placed in different catalogs. So if you have an M in front of it, that's the Macy catalog or Macy object. But NGC is the new general catalog. So there's also st statistical evidence that ciphered galaxies are more common in interacting pairs of galaxies than in isolated galaxies. These clues hint that ciphered galaxies may have been triggered into activity by collisions or interactions with companions. You'll find more such evidence as you study other kinds of active galaxies. Beginning in the 1950s, so let's start. So before we continue, this is called a double lobe radio sources due to the double lobes that we can see. So beginning in the 1950s, radio astronomers found that some sources of radio energy in the sky consisted of pairs of radio bright regions. When optical telescopes studied the locations of these radio sources, they revealed galaxies located between the two regions emitting radio energy. And the galaxies were dubbed double lobe radio galaxies. Unlike ciphered galaxies, which emit dense radiation from their cores, these radio galaxies were producing energy from the two external lobes. So here in the middle, that would be the galaxy, but here we will see the two radio lobes being emitted by the galaxy. So the shapes of the radio lobes suggest that they are inflated by jets of exciting gas emerging from the nucleus of the central galaxy. This has been called the double exhaust model. The presence of hot spots and signatron radiation shows that the jets are very powerful. You encountered signatron radiation previously in chapter 10, section 4 in the context of supernova remnants. Active galaxies that have jets and radio lobes are often deformed or interacting with other galaxies. The complex shapes of some jets and radio lobes can be explained by the motions of the active galactic nuclei. 
A good example of this is 3C31, so the 31st source in the third Cambridge catalog of radio sources, which is twisting radio lobes. These jets are consistent with matter falling towards a central supermassive black hole and then somehow being ejected into two directions. In previous chapters, you have seen similar jets produced by accretion disks around protostars. Neutron stars and stellar mass holes. Although the details are not entirely understood, the same process seems to produce in all of these jets. So the evidence shows that the cores of many galaxies are occupied by supermassive black holes with matter flowing inward. As the matter falls toward the center of it, releases tremendous gravitational energy and becomes intensely hot. The hot accretion disks can emit X-rays and eject jets in opposite directions. Now we're going to talk about a fascinating object called a quasar. So through the 1950s, radio astronomers became familiar with celestial radio sources that were either huge clouds of gas or distant radio galaxies. So they were surprised in the early 1960s when some radio sources turned out to look like stars and visual wavelength photographs. First called quasi star objects, they were soon referred to as quasars. Many more quasars have been found over the years, and most are radio silent. The radio astronomers stumbled over those emitting radio energy because they were easy to notice. Since their discovery, quasars have been a puzzle to astronomers. So in this image, we can see quasars have star-like images clearly different from images of even very distant galaxies. Although a quasar looks like a star, the spectra are unlike the spectra of stars or galaxies. The spikes on these images were produced by the fraction patterns in the telescope. So here we can see a galaxy, here's a foreground star, here's a quasar, um, and here is another galaxy. So the spectra of quasars were strange in that they contain a few undefined emission lines, super on a continuous spectrum. In 1963, Martin Schmidt at Hale Observatories tried redshifting the hydrogen polymer lines to see if they could be made to agree with the lines in the spectrum of quasar known as 3C273. At a redshift of 15.8%, three lines click into place. Other quasar spectra quickly yielded to this approach, revealing even larger redshifts. So here we can see the image of 3C273 shows the bright quasar at a center surrounded by a faint fuzz. So now the jet protruding the lower right. The original photographic plate holding a spectrum of 3C273 contains three hydrogen bulmer lines, hydrogen delta, hydrogen gamma, and hydrogen beta. The spectrum is redshifted by 15.8%. The dashed line shows the unshifted position of the spectrum. So here is the unshifted spectrum. And here is the red shifted spectrum. Numeratically, the red shift Z is the change in wavelengths, so lambda, so delta wavelength, divided by unshifted wavelength. So this is just one thing. So the red shift, so we can call the red shift Z, is just delta wavelength, so that means the change in the shift divided by the original wavelengths. So according to the Hubble law, these large redshifts imply very large distances. For the first quasars studied were the brighter ones, but the surveys have found many more. For example, the Sloan Digital Survey discovered 90,000 90, quasars. So most of these quasars have very high redshifts and lie very far from Earth. Many quasar redshifts are greater than one, and that might strike you as impossible. The Doppler formula implies that such objects would have velocities greater than the speed of light. But the redshifts of the galaxies and quasars are not produced by the Doppler effect. As you will discover in the next chapter, the redshifts are produced by the expansion of the universe, and astronomers must use the equations of general relativity to interpret them. 
Redshifts greater than one are not a problem and merely indicate great distance. Although the quasars are very far away, they are surprisingly bright. A typical galaxy at such a distance would be faint and extremely difficult to detect, but quasars show up on photographs as noticeable points of light. If you put the apparent brightness and each distance of quasars into the magnitude distance relation, you will discover that quasars are ultra luminous, having 10 to 1000 times the luminosity of a large galaxy. Soon after quasars were discovered, astronomers detected fluctuations in brightness over times as short as a few hours. Those rapid fluctuations show that quasars are small objects, not more than a few light hours in diameter, so smaller than our solar system. By the late 1960s, astronomers trying to understand quasars faced a problem. How could quasars be ultra luminous but also very small? What could make 10 to 1,000 times more energy than a galaxy in a region as small as our solar system? Since that time, new large telescopes in space and on Earth's surface have revealed that quasars are often surrounded by hazy features whose spectra resemble those of normal galaxies. Evidently, quasars are located in galaxies. In addition, radio telescopes have revealed that some quasars are ejecting jets and inflating radio loads. The evidence is now overwhelming that quasars are the active cause of very distant galaxies. In other words, quasars are the most extreme kind of active galactic nuclei. So you can now, since you now know that many galaxies contain supermassive black holes at a synthesis. So why do such objects produce eruptions and how do they form? So this would be the structure. So here we will have our creation disk, our supermassive black hole, the inner regions, so the opaque torus, and here we will have our relative jets and a shock wave. So is everyone still following? So do you guys have any ideas what or suggestions what might cause these eruptions? Yes, this is building up to walking radiation, but you guys know what causes walking radiation. So let's find out. So matter flowing inward towards a black hole spins very fast and becomes very hot. It spins because it must conserve angular momentum as it shrinks inward where it forms a flattened disk around a central black hole. Supermassive black holes have stronger gravity than stellar mass black holes and produce faster spins for the infrared matter and higher temperatures. Even a supermassive black hole is surprisingly small. A 10 million solar mass black hole would be only one fifth the diameter of Earth's orbit. So the matter can get close to the black hole or orbit very fast. The falling matter heats up because it picks up speed, and as it collides with other matter, those high velocities become thermal energy. That is, matter falling inward converts gravitational energy into thermal energy and becomes hot. Theoretical calculations predict that high temperatures puffs up the inner part of the disk and makes it thick. Even closer to the black hole, an orbital, orbiting particle is unstable and must spiral into the black hole. So the innermost part of the disk is empty and a black hole is hidden deep inside an empty central well. Further out of the disk is thinner and cooler, but the outermost part of the disk, according to calculations, is a fat, cool torus, so called torus is a donut shape of dusty gas. Astronomers can't see black holes, but in some active, galactic, active galaxies, the Hubble Space Telescope can detect the outer parts of the central disks. Spectra reveal that the speed of rotation and Kepler's third law yields the mass of the central object. The some supermassive black holes have masses of a few million solar masses, like the one in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, but the most massive contain billions of solar masses.
So here we can see the elliptical galaxy NGC 4261 is ejecting jets and inflating radio loads. High resolution images show that the core contains a small bright nucleus orbited by a spinning disk. The orbital velocity and size of the disk confirm that a central object is a supermassive black hole. So here we can see this disk encloses 1.2 billion solar mass and is perpendicular to the axis of the jets leading out to the radio lobes. So in a part of the accretion disk around the supermassive black hole can reach temperatures of millions of degrees and emit X-rays. In fact, cosmic ray detectors on Earth have observed all tri energy particles that come from places in the sky occupied by active galactic nuclei. These powerful supermassive black holes and their hot accretion disks may be filling the universe with high speed particles, packing the wallop of major league fastballs. No one knows exactly how the supermassive black hole and its disk produces jets of gas and radiation, but magnetic fields are a factor because the disk is at least partially ionized. Magnetic fields are trapped in the gas of the disk, drawn inward and bound and wound up. Fury suggests that it, this creates powerful magnetic tubes extending along the axis of rotation, channeling hot gas outwards in opposite directions. These jets seem to originate very close to the supermassive black hole and are then focused and confined by the enclosing magnetic tubes. The mechanism that produces jets is understood only in a general way but astronomers are now trying to work out the details. So how can the supermassive black holes explain all of the different kinds of active galaxies that are observed? When a field of research is young, scientists find many seemingly different phenomena, such as sci-fi galaxies, double lobe radio galaxies, quasars, cosmic jets, and so on. As the research matures, Scientists begin seeing similarities and eventually are able to unify different phenomena as different aspects of a single process. This organization of evidence and theory into logical arguments that explain how nature works is the real goal of science. Astronomers studying active galaxies have developed a unified model of active galaxy cores that is well supported by evidence. So monster black hole is the centerpiece. According to the unified model, what you see when you view the cores of an active galaxy depends on how the black hole's accretion disk is tipped with respect to your line of sight. You should note that accretion disk may be tipped at a steep angle to the plane of its galaxy. So just because you see a galaxy face on doesn't mean you're looking at the accretion disk face on. So here we can see these are Arthur's representations. So in image A, Arthur's conception of an active galactic nuclei viewed edge on with the view of the hot accretion disk in a central cavity around a supermassive black hole blocked by the outer cool dusty gas torus. Then image B features visible the spectrum of an HN depends on the angle at which it is viewed. The unified model shown in cross section suggests that matter flowing inward passes first through a large opaque torus then into a thin hard disk and then finally into a small hot cavity around a black hole telescopes viewing such a disk edge on would see only narrow spectral lines from cooler gas but a telescope looking into the central cavity would see broad spectral lines formed by hot gas this diagram is not to scale. The central cavity may be only 0.01 parsec in radius, whereas the outer torus may be a thousand parsec in radius. The spectrum you observe depends on the angle of the disk. If you view the accretion disk edge on, you cannot see into the central area. If you see the lower temperatures and velocities, if a disk is tipped so you can see the hot inner gas, you see high temperatures and velocities. If a disk is nearly face on, you would be looking directly into the central cavity down the dragon's throat, and you would see extreme conditions. A few active galaxies have such spectra. 
The unified model is far from complete. The actual structure of accretion disks is poorly understood, as is the process by which the disk produces jets. The unified model does not explain all of the differences among active galaxies and quasars. Rather, it is a model that provides some clues to what is happening in active galactic nuclei. Most galaxies contain supermassive black holes at its centers, but only a few percent of galaxies have active nuclei. That must mean that most of the supermassive black holes are dormant. So what could trigger a supermassive black hole to erupt? Answer is something that you studied back in chapter four, tides. Tides twist interacting galaxies and rip matter away into tidal tails. But mathematical models show that those same interactions can also throw matter inward. Even a small amount of matter falling into a black hole can produce an outburst. The sudden flood of matter flowing into the equation disk around a supermassive black hole would trigger it into an eruption. So here we see a star, possibly the tube by an encounter with another star, drifts toward a supermassive black hole. As the near side of the star tries to orbit faster than a far side, the star is torn apart by tidal forces. Most of the mass of the star is flung away from the black hole, but roughly 1% falls towards the black hole to form an accretion disk. So in this image is basically an orbiting X-ray telescope observing active galaxies, sometimes detect X-ray flares, equaling the energy of supernova explosions. These flares are evidently caused by a star that wanders too close to the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy and tidal forces rip the star apart. This explains why active galaxies often is often distorted. They have been twisted by tidal forces as they interact or merge with another galaxy. Some active galaxies have nearby companions, and you can suspect that the companions are guilty of tidal distortion, the other galaxy, and triggering an eruption. Presumably, the AGN was triggered into activity by the same tidal interactions that pulled away the streamer. Galaxy IC2497 provides a dramatic example of the galaxy interactions and active nuclei. Near the galaxy lies a glowing green cloud of gas, named Annie's Fuerbeer. The object is part of a stream of gas, dust, and stars pulled out of the galaxy by a recent interaction. When a beam of energy coming from the active nucleus of the galaxy shines on a streamer, the gas is excited to glow green in a forbidden emission lines. So images of some quasars reveal they are embodied, embedded in galaxies that are distorted and lie near other distorted galaxies. So here we can see a beam of energy, energy from active galaxy IC2497 in a top image illuminates part of the infalling streamer of matter, exciting the gas to glow green. The glowing cloud was discovered by Dutch high school teacher Hanni van Arkel while using a personal computer with the Galaxy Zoo project, which recruits amateurs to classify the millions of galaxies found in deep surveys. The object's name Hanni's Voorwerp means Hanni's object in Dutch. Now classified as a quasar, the active nucleus may have turned on as recently as 200,000 years ago. So here we can see two quasars are embedded in merging galaxies. The tidal forces have flung out tidal tails, the sheer sign of galaxies merging. Evidence shows that galaxies and supermassive black holes have evolved together. Astronomers can see this progression because at great distances, the look back time is large and observations reveal the universe as it was long ago. The masses of supermassive black holes are related to the masses of those galaxies, so the central bulges. In each case, the mass of the black hole is about 0.5% the mass of the surrounding central bulge. But there is no relation to the mass of the disks of galaxies. 
This reveals that a formation of supermassive black holes was connected with the formation of the central bulges. They formed and evolved together. So in the next chapter, you will see evidence that the universe began 13.8 billion years ago and that it has been expanding ever since. Within a few hundred million years, the first clouds of gas began forming stars and falling together to form the great star clouds that became the central bulges of galaxies. The first massive black holes formed at the same time. In fact, some evidence suggests that the black holes formed first and pulled matter inward to form central bulges. Matter flooding into these black holes would have triggered powerful outbursts. The formation of a central bulge was evidently a violent process. Eruptions of the growing central black hole could have pushed away in falling gas and limited the material available to form the stars of the central bulge. Also, in falling matter can trigger bursts of star formation and resulting supernovae can blow gas out of the galaxy and also limit bulge growth. Some of the most distant quasars could have been caused by the formation of supermassive black holes, but these extremely distant objects are difficult to image with existing telescopes. Most of the quasars and other active galaxies that astronomers see with today's telescopes have been triggered into eruption by the interaction, collision and merging of galaxies, a process that throws matter into the central black holes. Collisions have been important in the evolution of galaxies and supermassive black holes. So when the universe was young and had not expanded very much, galaxies were closer together and collided more often. Also, as small galaxies fell inward and formed the halos and disks of larger galaxies, more matter would have been fed inward to the supermassive black holes and triggered more eruptions. Observations show in the first half of the history of the universe, each galaxy merged with other galaxies as often as three times every billion years. Most mergers were with smaller galaxies, but a few would have been with large galaxies and triggered eruptions visible from Earth today as quasars. Quasars are most common with redshifts over two and less common with redshifts above three. The largest quasar redshifts are greater than six, but such high redshift quasars are rare. Evidently, astronomers see few quasars at high redshifts because they are looking back to an age when the universe was so young, it had not yet formed many galaxies. At redshifts between two and three, galaxies were actively growing and colliding, and quasars were about a thousand times more common than they are now. Nevertheless, even during the age of quasars, Quasar eruptions must have been unusual. At any one time, only a small fraction of galaxies had quasars erupting in their course. As smaller galaxies were gobbled up and expansion of the universe scurried galaxies away from each other, galaxy formation became less active, interactions between galaxies became rare, and quasars became even less common. So where are all the dead quasars? There is no way to get rid of a supermassive black hole. So all of the galaxies that once had quasars must still have those black holes, now dormant in their cores. Where are all those dead quasars today? You know where to look, the cores of galaxies. Most large galaxies contain supermassive black holes at the centers, but the black holes have consumed most up of the nearby gas, dust and stars and are now dormant. Our own Milky Way galaxy could have had a quasar at its core long ago, but now its central supermassive black hole is on a strict diet. A slow trickle of matter flowing into the black hole could explain the mild activity seen there. Occasional interactions between galaxies can throw matter inward and awaken a supermassive black hole into eruption as a safer galaxy or double-lobed radio galaxy. Then where are all the dead quasars? Uh, okay, so this is a copy of the slide we had. So the active galaxies are not a rare kind of galaxy. They are normal galaxies passing through a stage that many galaxies experience. They are not really peculiar. 
They are an important part of the story of the formation and evolution of galaxies. So, a few reasons to fall in love with a black hole and not with a gold. One, a black hole will keep your secrets with itself forever. Two, a black hole will hug you so tightly that you will never be able to escape it. And thirdly, understanding black holes is difficult, but much, much simpler than understanding a goal. So ladies and gentlemen, that is our lecture on galaxies. Do you guys have any questions? So if you guys can you guys figure out where this is all leading up to. <laughs> that is a very good question, Mr. Rumba. It's a pleasure. So we're going to start a new set of lecture slides now. So if load shedding hit danger, you can just watch the recordings in your own time. But uh, we are still I'm not through the first period yet. So we are continuing with our lecture slides. But can you guys guess where this is leading up to? Or what are we going to discuss next? The Big Bang is correct, but where does the Big Bang fit into? What is the field of astronomy that covers the Big Bang? Yes, that is correct. The universe, so cosmology. So now we're going to start looking at cosmology. So cosmology is studying the universe in its whole. So instead of just looking at different stars, different planets, uh, different galaxies, we are now putting everything together in cosmology. So is now looking at all the galaxies, how everything has started, how everything fits together. And this can be really, really interesting work. So before we begin our cosmology lecture, I want to show you guys a quick video on cosmology. What is the nature of the universe? How's that for a question? For a long time, we humans had no idea what was going on in the universe. To help, we made up stories to either help us explain what we saw or to make us feel better about what we didn't understand. But then science came along and we started to understand more. We could test our ideas and as we got more confident in the process, our ideas grew. The field of cosmology was born, the study of the cosmos itself. And now, after centuries of speculation, and just so stories, we're starting to get a grasp on the biggest ideas there are. What is the nature of the universe? Let's find out. By the turn of the 20th century, scientists knew the Earth was old. 
Darwin's theory of evolution strongly implied the Earth was at least millions of years old, and Lord Kelvin, a hugely respected physicist and engineer, confirmed the Earth was ancient, given that it must have cooled from an initially molten state. That takes a while, at least a million years. How old exactly, no one knew. As for the universe itself, it logically must be as old or older than Earth. A popular model for the universe was that it was static. It is, and always has been as we see it now, and in general hasn't changed. Stars may be born and they may die, but overall things pretty much stayed in balance. The universe always existed, always will, always had galaxies in it, and so on. There are variations on this idea, but that's it in a nutshell, and it's what many astronomers believed. This is important. When we try to understand observations in astronomy, we fit them into a framework of understanding, things we think we already know. When something doesn't fit, it's a problem. Maybe the observation is wrong, or maybe we're misinterpreting it, or maybe the framework is wrong. That's a big step to undertake and needs proper contemplation and skepticism. Science is a tapestry, and when you yank at one thread, the whole thing may need reweaving. Sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, you have to yank that thread. The thread that got pulled in this picture was first uncovered in 1912. That was when astronomer Vesto Slipher, who has the uncontested coolest name for an astronomer ever, started taking spectra of the so-called spiral nebulae, hoping to get some insight on their characteristics. Remember, this was before we understood what galaxies actually were. It took him several years of observations, but by 1917, he had observed 25 of them, and he found something astonishing. When he examined their spectra, he saw that almost all of them were highly redshifted. In other words, it looked like most of these objects were rushing away from us at high speed, millions of kilometers per hour. What could that mean? At this point, two different lines of work began to converge. One was by a Belgian theoretical physicist named Georges Lemaitre. In the 1920s, he had been studying Albert Einstein's work, the equations dealing with the behavior of the universe as a whole. Einstein had concluded that the universe was static, unchanging, but Lemaitre disagreed. He found that an expanding or contracting universe fit the equations better. And given the redshifts observed by Slipher, he proposed the universe itself was getting bigger, which is why the galaxies appeared to be moving away from us. Another brilliant physicist, Alexander Friedman, had also reached the same conclusion. At the same time, astronomers were trying to determine the distances to the nebulae, now understood to be galaxies in their own right. As I mentioned in our first episode about galaxies, Edwin Hubble and his assistant, Milton Hummison, were at the forefront of this. They observed variable stars in the Andromeda galaxy that allowed them to get the distance to the galaxy. They then observed some of the same galaxies Slipher did and measured their distance. When they compared distances to the redshift Slipher observed, they found that the farther away the galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. Let me repeat that because it's kind of important. The farther away a galaxy was, the faster it appeared to recede from us. Some other astronomers had also found similar results, but the work of Hubble and Hummison clinched it. We now know it to be true for every distant galaxy we observe. They are all redshifted, all heading away from us. And this ties into what Lemaitre had concluded. The universe is expanding. Wait, what? The universe is getting bigger? How can that be? What does that even mean? There are lots of different ways of looking at this. Lemaitre himself suggested imagining the cosmic clock running backwards. Right now, as time inexorably marches on, all the galaxies in the sky are getting farther and farther away from us. But that means that in the past, they were closer together. Run the clock back far enough, and they get closer and closer together until at some point in the past, everything in the entire universe was crammed together into an uber Thing. That is a really, really weird thought. It's hard to imagine everything in the whole cosmos, every star, nebula, galaxy, every atom, electron, and proton, all squeezed together into one infinitely dense blob. But that's what the observations are telling us. Lemaitre called this a primeval atom, or more colorfully, the cosmic egg. Fair enough. But this has implications. If you squeeze all the energy everywhere into one place, that place is going to be hot. When the universe was a tiny dot, it would have been unimaginably hellishly hot. Then, for some reason, it suddenly expanded violently and started cooling. This sounds an awful lot like an explosion, bang, involving the entire universe, which is big. What else would you call this but the Big Bang? In fact, the term became popular when astronomer Fred Hoyle used it on a radio show and later in a widely read magazine article. Ironically, he meant it somewhat disparagingly since he didn't think the Big Bang model was correct. To his and any other astronomer's chagrin, the name stuck. I like it. It's not perfectly accurate, but it's succinct. Again, this is all pretty strange and astronomers had a hard time accepting it. 
after all. It went against everything they thought was true at the time. In science, though, a hypothesis needs to make testable predictions before it can be taken seriously. What predictions could the Big Bang model of the universe make that we can observe today? The speed of light is fast. 300,000 kilometers per second, or about a billion kilometers per hour. Like I said, fast, but not infinitely fast. The sun is 150 million kilometers away. It takes light about eight minutes to reach the earth. So in a sense, you're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. The nearest star system to us is Alpha Centauri, 4.3 light years away. So we see it as it was 4.3 years ago. The Andromeda galaxy is about 2.5 million light years away. The light we see from it now left that galaxy when Australopithecus walked the earth. The farther away something is, the farther in the past we see it. This is called the look back time, and it's a crucial tool for cosmology. By observing very distant objects, we can see the universe when it was young. You might think that we could see all the way back to the moment of the Big Bang, but there's a problem. At some point back in time, the universe was so hot and dense that it was the same temperature as the surface of a star. It would have been very luminous, but also opaque. As it expanded, it cooled and became transparent. If we look back far enough, that moment in time when it cleared up is as far back as we can see. What does that moment look like? By looking at the physics of the Big Bang, the math that describes how matter, energy, space, and time behave, astronomers could predict when this moment happened in the lifetime of the universe, a few hundred thousand years after the bang itself. Using the idea of look-back time, they could predict how far away it would be from us and therefore calculate its redshift. Remember, redshift stretches the wavelength of light. The light the universe emitted at the time would have been like a star in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But the light that reaches us billions of years later, now, should be redshifted into microwave wave. In 1965, a pair of radio astronomers announced they had found a signal in their radio telescope that was like a background noise coming from everywhere in the sky. They tried everything they could to explain it, including scraping out the bird poop inside their radio telescope in case that might be causing it. But the only thing that made sense was that this was indeed the redshifted light from the early universe. They had discovered the glow of the fireball left over from the birth of the cosmos. Later in the 1990s, satellite observations further refine the measurements of this cosmic microwave background, and now it's essentially confirmed. This glow was successfully predicted by the Big Bang model, and now we see it in exquisite detail. Its discovery was a huge step in cosmology. The redshift of distant galaxies and the cosmic background are not the only confirmations we have that the Big Bang model is correct. For example, the model also makes predictions about the elements we see in the universe. At first, when the universe was dense and hot, only subatomic particles could exist. But as the universe cooled, for a brief time, they could fuse and form heavier elements. Big Bang model predicts certain abundances of elements, ratios of them compared to hydrogen, and that's just what we see in the universe at large. Also, the sizes and shapes of the largest structures in the cosmos are in line with what a Big Bang model predicts. There's lots of other observational evidence as well. Pretty much every modern astronomer on Earth understands that the Big Bang model of how the universe got its start is the correct one. But what does it mean? I mean, physically. It's a very common misconception that the Big Bang was an explosion in space with everything rushing away from some point. But that's not what's really happening. Remember, I've talked about space being a thing in which matter and energy exist. Space can be warped or bent by mass, creating what we think of as gravity. When we talk about the universe expanding, we mean space itself is expanding. And when it does, it carries galaxies along with it. In a sense, it's like having a rubber ruler. When you pull on it, it gets longer, and the distance between the tick marks gets wider. When the ruler doubles in length, the tick marks that started out a millimeter apart are now two millimeters apart. But tick marks that were 10 centimeters apart are now 20 centimeters apart. In other words, the farther away a tick mark is, the faster it appears to move away. Sound familiar? That's just what galaxy redshifts are telling us. It also means that, really, the galaxies aren't actually doing any moving. It's that space between them is expanding. This may seem like a nitpicky semantic point, but it's physically true. The galaxies are, for all intents and purposes, standing still. The space in between them is where all the action is. And it gets even weirder. This is true no matter where you are in the universe. From any galaxy, it looks like all the others are rushing away from you. Look back at that ruler. No matter what tick mark you start with, when the ruler stretches from that spot, it looks like the tick marks are all moving away from you. This is what Einstein's equations showed and what Lemaitre saw in them. 
space is expanding. But that means the Big Bang wasn't an explosion in some pre-existing space. It was the initial exploding expansion of space itself. The universe isn't expanding into anything because it's all there is. There's nothing outside the universe for it to expand into. This also means the universe has no center, no point of origin. Imagine the ruler is now a circle and the diameter is expanding. No tick mark is the actual center, yet no matter where you are on the ruler, every tick mark appears to move away from you. In a similar way, every spot in the universe appears like the center, which means none is. No place in the universe is more special than any place else. We're all in this together. It can be hard to grasp, and I'll admit, we all have some difficulty with these concepts, but the math bears them out, and so do essentially all the observations we make of the distant universe. And in all this weirdness, don't lose sight of the big picture. The universe had a beginning, and we can see evidence of it. Not only that, but by measuring how quickly it's expanding, we can use math to run the clock backwards and determine the age of the universe. Currently, the best measurement we have of the age of the universe is 13.82 billion years. Or perhaps I should say 13.82 billion years. That's an amazing number. It's a long, long time, three times older than the Earth. But what gets me is that we can figure it out at all. Be smart, us apes. Today you learn that distant galaxies show a redshift in their spectra, which means they're moving The previous episode of Crash Course Astronomy was a bit of a brain stretcher. We saw that the universe is expanding, space is expanding, and it's carrying galaxies along with it. That means it was denser in the past, and at some point, 13.82 billion years ago, to be fairly precise, all of space, time, matter, and energy was compressed into a single infinitely dense point. Astronomers call this the singularity, which is as good a name as any. Something caused this singularity to suddenly let loose, expanding violently, cooling, and forming the universe we see today. Coming to grips with this idea took a while for astronomers, but nowadays the current working model for how the universe started is with a Big Bang. All the galaxies we see are moving away from each other as space expands between them, that is, on large scales. Remember the ruler analogy, where on small scales, the expansion is small, and on bigger scales, the expansion is faster. That's why distant galaxies appear to be rushing away from us faster. On small scales, the expansion is small enough that gravity can overcome it. The Andromeda galaxy, for example, is about 2.5 million light years away. That means it should be moving away from us at about 50 or so kilometers per second. But because of our mutual gravity, it's moving toward us. Its motion locally through space is more than enough to overcome the expansion of space between us. It's like running up the down escalator. Run fast enough and you can make it to the top. But every galaxy has gravity and there are a lot of galaxies in the universe. That adds up and should affect the expansion rate. It's a lot like the idea of escape velocity. Throw a rock hard enough and even though gravity will slow it down, it will escape. But if you don't throw it fast enough, it'll slow, stop, reverse course, and fall back down. Astronomers fully expected to see this effect on the expansion of space. If you looked on the very largest of scales, you'd expect to see the universe slowing down, the gravity of the matter in the universe itself putting the brakes on the expansion. And with the discovery of dark matter, that meant the universe should be slowing down even more than we first thought. But when astronomers went looking for evidence of this, what they got instead was probably the single biggest shock in the history of astronomy. In the 1990s, two teams of astronomers were using the world's biggest telescopes to peer as deeply as they could into the universe. They were looking for incredibly distant supernovae, and not just any kind, but special ones called Type 1As. I'm 
talked about these before. They occur when a white dwarf increases in mass until electron degeneracy pressure can no longer sustain it against its own gravity. It collapses, undergoes a catastrophic wave of thermonuclear fusion, and explodes. The beauty of these types of supernovae is that they all occur when the mass of the white dwarf gets to about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. That's the magic number where pressure overcomes gravity and they go kablooey. That makes them good standard candles, objects whose intrinsic brightness, whose luminosity is known. Knowing that, plus measuring how bright they appear to be in a telescope, lets you calculate their distances. Then those can be compared to the supernovae redshifts, which is a different way of getting their distance. This then tells you how fast the universe is expanding on really big scales. But the results they got didn't make sense. Time and again, the supernovae were all fainter than they expected. It was as if the predictions based on the redshifts were underestimating the distances to the exploding stars. The astronomers did everything they could to see if maybe they had made a mistake somewhere, including making a literal list of things that could make stars look fainter. Intergalactic dust, different chemical compositions, for the stars that blew up, all kinds of things. But in the end, both teams independently came to the same conclusion. The supernovae were farther away than expected. And that meant something truly shocking. The expansion of the universe was accelerating. Now remember, that's nuts. We were expecting the expansion of space to be slowing down due to the gravity of all the matter in the universe. But instead, it was speeding up. It's hard to overstate how shocking this is. It's like tossing a rock in the air, and instead of it slowing down and falling back down into your hand, it shot upwards faster and faster, defying Earth's gravity. Of course, scientists were skeptical. Many still are. But in the end, several other independent measurements have verified this result. The universe is not only expanding, but that expansion is getting faster every day. What could possibly cause such a thing? To be flatly honest, we don't know. Well. Not exactly. But whatever it is acts like an energy suffusing space, pushing on the expansion. And we can't see it, so it's invisible. We already have dark matter, so naturally this got tagged dark energy. It seems to be a property of space itself, a tiny bit of energy in every single cubic centimeter of the universe. The amount per cc is incredibly small, but there are a lot of cubic centimeters in the universe. It adds up, and we can add it up. Now that we have measurements of this, we can take an inventory of the universe. We can total all of the matter and energy there is, making a sort of budget of stuff in the cosmos. When we do, it looks like this. 95% of the universe is made of stuff we can't directly see. Normal matter is outnumbered 20 to 1. Maybe we should rethink calling it normal. So if two thirds of the cosmic budget is made up of dark energy, it must have some pretty big effects, right? Yeah, like changing the eventual fate of the entire universe. A big question, one of the biggest is, will the universe expand forever? Well, astronomers have a framework to answer this question. We call it the geometry of the universe. Matter has gravity and gravity bends space. So is there enough matter in the universe to stop the expansion? The geometry of the universe mathematically describes its overall curvature, the shape of space on the largest scales of all. To be clear, this concept is important to cosmologists, but it can be weird and confusing to someone who is just learning about all this. Still, a lot of astronomy classes teach it, so I'm going to go over it very briefly. And if you want more information, we have links in the doobly-doo. The idea behind the geometry of the universe is that if there's enough matter, the cosmic expansion will slow stop, and then everything will recollapse, a sort of big bang in reverse. If there's not enough matter, then the universe will expand forever. And in between the two, there's just enough matter that the expansion slows, but never quite reaches zero until an infinite amount of time in the future. Conceptually, it's a lot like escape velocity. It was once thought that the geometry of the universe, tied to the amount of matter in it, determined its destiny. But dark energy threw a monkey in the wrench for that, and geometry alone doesn't determine the eventual fate of the cosmos. We think there's enough dark energy in space to ensure the expansion will continue forever, despite the geometry. Dark energy is just too powerful and will always drive the expansion of the universe ever faster. So for now, the answer, as far as we can see, is yes, the universe will expand forever. Okay, there's one more brain melty thing we need to talk about. For this part, you might want to sit down. Space itself is expanding. As light travels from one galaxy to the next, it fights that expansion, losing energy, just like you use up energy climbing a staircase. When light loses energy, its wavelength gets longer. That's what cosmological redshift is. The more distant the galaxy, the faster it recedes, and the more energy light loses as it travels to us. But wait, at some distance from us, space would be expanding so quickly that a galaxy in that part of the universe would be moving away from us at the speed of light. Anything farther away would be swept away from us 
faster than light. Now, before we start complaining, yes, this is possible. The speed of light is the ultimate speed limit in the universe. If you're traveling through space, but space itself is exempt from that rule. It can expand it at whatever speed it wants. The matter in it, galaxies, stars, and such, is swept along with it, so they're not traveling so much through space as with it. When you solve the equations to calculate distance and redshift, the distance a galaxy would have to be from us to be moving away at the speed of light is about 13.8 billion light years. Here's the fun thing. We can still see galaxies that far away. We can even see them farther than that. How? It's because that distance is how far the galaxy is from us now. When it emitted that light, the universe was much younger, smaller, and the galaxy closer to us. It would have been about 4.5 billion light years away at the time, and the light took over 9 billion years to get here. Back then, the space between us and the galaxy wasn't expanding as rapidly, so the light could keep pace. Now, after all this time, the space between us and that galaxy means we're moving away from each other at light speed. But back then, we were close enough to see each other. For that same reason, we can see galaxies that are moving away from us faster than light. Because when they emitted that light, there was less space separating us. The most distant galaxies we see are now about 45 billion light years from us. We call this the radius of the observable universe. It's essentially the cosmic horizon. Mind you, the actual universe may be far larger than this. Who knows, maybe even infinite but we can only see galaxies that are, by now, 45 billion light years away. That's our horizon. If space were simply expanding, the size of the observable universe would expand as well. But we have dark energy, and space expands more rapidly every day. That means a truly distant galaxy's light is fighting more and more expansion all the time. It's like climbing an ever-steepening staircase. Compared to a constant expansion, a galaxy in an accelerating universe has to be closer for us to see it it's losing energy faster. Worse, that fight gets harder every day. A galaxy just at the cosmic horizon, right on the edge of the observable universe now, might be visible. But in the future, the space between us and it will have expanded even more. The light can't beat that expansion, and it'll never reach us. The galaxy, over time, disappears. This has a weird and unnerving effect. The observable universe is getting smaller. The cosmic horizon is approaching us. Eventually, it'll be so close that every galaxy in the sky except our own will lie beyond it. At that point, our own galactic gravity may overcome the expansion of space, so we'll remain intact. But the sky beyond will be black the edge of the universe hanging over us just a few hundred thousand light years away instead of tens of billions. It's the ultimate irony. The universe itself is expanding, but we see less of it every day. So we'd better study it while we can. We may only have a few trillion more years left to figure this out. Today you learn that the majority So I know this is a bit mind-boggling concepts we are going to learn about tonight, but that is an essence cosmology. So now we're going to take a closer look to what cosmology is. And then after this lecture and the new work, we're going to circle back and going to start looking at smaller things again. So after this lecture, we are going to change a bit of direction and look at our own solar system again. So Question of cosmology, does it also tell us how Earth was formed? Yes, in essence, it does. And that is something we are going to do in a future lecture as well. I see we lost a few people due to low chilling. Are the rest of you still with me and still awake? Awesome. So, in this lecture, we are going to look at the introduction to the universe, what a universe is, how it fits together, the Big Bang Theory, space and time, mass and gravity, and then what is 21st century cosmology? So this is the best picture for estimation we have on a time scale of our galaxy. So here we have the Big Bang, so that is 13.7 billion years ago. Then we have inflation. Here we have the cosmic microwave background, starts to show its afterglow, the first stars, first galaxies, in expansion accelerates, and here is where we are today. So here is another way 
to put it. So here we can see at zero seconds, this is where the Big Bang happened. And then at 0 0.001 nanoseconds, we can see neutrons and protons start forming at 100 nanoseconds. We can see nuclei forming. 300,000 years, the recombination of atoms. In 3 million years, we can see the first stars forming. At 1 billion years, we can see the first galaxies forming. At 3 billion years, is reheating of the intergalactic gas. And then at 13.7 billion years is where we are today with clusters of galaxies. So from the great physicist Richard Feynman, I, a universe of atoms, an atom in the universe. Are you guys all familiar with Professor Richard Feynman? So Richard Feynman is basically the father of electromagnetism and he's won a Nobel Prize for it. And when the Space Shuttle Disaster Challenger happened, he was one of the investigating officers to determine what happened. So he's a brilliant physicist. Um, some of his lectures were recorded and uploaded to YouTube, so you can find it properly as the Feynman lectures. Uh, that is worthwhile to watch. He was a brilliant guy. So journey through the universe. Now you have reached the limit of your travels in space and time and can contemplate the universe as a whole. The ideas in this chapter among the biggest and most difficult in all of science. Because can you imagine a limitless universe or the first instant of time? As you explore cosmology, you will find answers to three important questions. Firstly, do the universe have an edge and a center? Secondly, what is the evidence that the universe began with a Big Bang, an expansion from a hard dense state? And then thirdly, how has the universe evolved and what will be its fate? So looking at your thumb, the matter in your body was present in the fiery beginning of the universe. Cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole, can tell you where your matter came from. And it can tell you where your matter is going. Cosmology is a mind-bending weird subject and you can enjoy it for its strange ideas. It is fun to think about space stretching like a rubber sheet, invisible energy pushing the universe to expand faster and faster, and the origin of the vast walls of galaxy clusters. Notice that this is better than speculation. It is all supported by evidence. Cosmology, however, strange it may seem, is a serious and logical attempt to understand the structure and evolution of the entire universe. This chapter will help you climb the cosmology pyramid one step at a time. You already have some ideas about what a universe is like. Start with those ideas, test them against observations, and also compare them with scientific theories. Step by step, you can build a modern understanding of cosmology. Each step in a pyramid is small, but it leads to some astonishing insights into how the universe works and how you came to be part of it. So here we can see the cosmology pyramid. So we first going to look at the universe does not have an edge. It gets dark at night. Expand the universe, the Big Bang beginning. Seeing the glow of the Big Bang, birth of matter and atoms, birth of galaxies, curved space-time, dark matter, inflation, acceleration, dark energy. And then in the future, cosmologists will add more and more steps to this pyramid. Most people have an impression of the universe as a vast ocean of space filled with stars and galaxies. But as you begin exploring the universe, you need to become aware that your expectations, so they do not mislead you, 
The first step is to deal with an expectation so obvious that most people don't think about it for the sake of a quiet life. So in this image, we can see the entire sky is filled with galaxies. Some lie in clusters are thousands and others are isolated in nearly empty voids between the clusters. In this image of the typical spot on the sky, most of the bright objects are foreground stars. Their spikes are caused by the fraction in the telescope. All other objects are galaxies ranging from the relatively close face on spiral at upper right to the most distant galaxies visible only in the infrared, shown as red in the composite image. So now we can talk about the A to H center problem. In your daily life, you are accustomed to boundaries. Rooms have walls. Athletic fields have boundary lines, countries have borders, oceans have shores. It is natural to think of the universe also as having an edge, but that idea can't be right. If the universe had an edge, imagine going to that edge, what would you find there? A wall of some type? Great empty space? Nothing? Even a child can ask, if there is an edge to the universe, what's beyond it? The true edge would have to be more than just an end to the distribution of matter. It would have to be an end of space itself. But then, what would happen if you tried to reach the past or move past that edge? An edge to the universe violate, violates common sense and modern observations, which you will study later in this chapter, indicate that the universe could be infinite and would therefore have no edge. Perhaps even more important, if the universe has no edge, then it cannot have a center. You find the centers of things, pizzas, footballs, oceans, galaxies, by referring to the edges. If the universe has no edge, then it cannot have a center. It's a common misconception to imagine that the universe has a center, but as you realize that is impossible, as you study cosmology, you should take care to avoid thinking that there is a center of the universe. The idea of a beginning. Of course, you have noticed that the night sky is dark. That is an important observation because you may be surprised to learn seemingly reasonable assumptions about the universe can lead to the conclusion that the night sky actually should glow blindingly bright. This conflict between observation and theory is called Olbers' paradox after Heinrich Olbers, the physician and astronomer who publicized the problem in 1826. The problem of the dark night sky was first discussed by Thomas Diggis in 1576, but Olbers gets the credit through an accident of scholarship on a part of modern scientists who were not aware of earlier discussions. The point made by all this seems simple. Suppose you assume, as that most scientists in all this time, that the universe is infinite in size, infinite in age, so static, a fancy word for unchanging overall, and filled with stars. If you look in any direction, the line of sight must eventually run into the surface of a star. The clumping of stars into galaxies and galaxies into clusters can be shown mathematically to make no difference. So look at figure 4, 14.3, which uses the analogy of lines of sight in a forest. The use of analogies in science is discussed in when you are deep in a forest, every line of sight ends at a tree trunk, and you cannot see out of the forest. So this is what is meant by this analogy. So in image A, every direction you look in a forest eventually reaches a tree trunk, and you cannot see out of forest. Then image B, if the universe is infinite and filled with stars, then any line from Earth should eventually reach the surface of a star. This assumption leads to the prediction that the entire night sky should glow about as bright as the surface of the sun, a puzzle commonly referred to as Olbers paradox. By analogy to the view from inside a forest, every line of sight from Earth into space should eventually end at the surface of a star. Of course, the more distant stars would be fainter in nearby stars because of the inverse square law. However, 
the farther you look into space, the larger the vacuum you are viewing, and the more stars are included. The two effects cancel out. The result would be that the entire sky should be as bright as the sun as an average starlight suns, crowded shoulder to shoulder, covering the sky from horizon to horizon. It should not get dark at night. Astronomers and physicists who study cosmology, called cosmologists, now believe they understand why the sky is dark. All this paradox makes an incorrect prediction because it is based on incorrect assumptions. The universe may be infinite in size, but is neither infinitely old nor static. The essence of modern cosmologists' answer to this question was suggested first by Edgar Allan Poe in 1848. Poe proposed that a night sky is dark because the universe is not infinitely old, but came into existence at some finite time in the past. The more distant stars are so far away that light from them has not yet reached Earth. That is, if you look far enough away, the look back time approaches the edge of the universe, and you see to a time before the first stars began to shine. The night sky is dark because the universe had a beginning. You can now answer this oldest question and understood, understand why the night sky is dark by revising your original assumptions about the universe. The answer to all this question is a powerful idea because it clearly illustrates the differences between the universe and the observable universe. The universe is everything that exists and it could be infinite. The observable universe in contrast is the part, maybe a very small part, that you can see from Earth using the most powerful telescopes. You will later learn in this chapter about evidence that the universe is around 14 billion years old. That means you can't observe objects further away than a loop back time of around 14 million years. Do not confuse the observable universe, which is huge but finite, with the universe as a whole, which might be infinite. There is a common misconception that the universe is unchanging overall and not evolving. In the next section, you will discover that the universe is actually changing. So now we're going to touch on the cosmic expansion. In 1929, Edwin Hubble published his discovery that the sizes of galaxy redshifts are proportional to the galaxy distances. Nearby galaxies have small redshifts and more distant galaxies have large redshifts. You learn this as the Hubble law in chapter 13. So when you use it to estimate the distances to galaxies, those galaxy red shifts, interpreted as Doppler shifts, imply that galaxies are receding from each other, an idea that became known as the expanding universe. Figure 14.4 shows spectra of galaxies and galaxy clusters at various distances. The further cluster is relatively nearby and its red shifts are small. The hydra cluster is very distant and its red shift is so large that the two dark spectral lines formed by ionized calcium are shifted from near ultraviolet as well into the visible part of the spectrum. So here we can see these galaxy spectra extended from the near ultraviolet at the left to the blue part of the visible spectrum at right. The two dark absorption lines of once ionized calcium are prominent in the near ultraviolet. The redshifts in galaxy spectra are expressed here as apparent velocities of recession. Note that the apparent velocity of recession is proportional to distance, which is known as the Hubble law. The expansion of the universe does not imply that Earth has a special location. We see why look at figure 14.5, which shows an analogy to baking raisin bread. As the dough rises, it pushes the raisins away from each other at speeds that are proportional to distance. Two raisins that were originally close to each other 
are pushed apart slowly, but two raisins that were far apart, having more dough between them, are pushed apart faster. If bacterial astronomers lived on a raisin in a raisin bread, they could observe the redshifts of other raisins and derive a bacterial Hubble law. They would conclude that the universe was expanding uniformly. It does not matter which raisin the material astronomers lived on, they would get the same Hubble law. No raisin has a special viewpoint. Similarly, astronomers in any galaxy will see the same law of expansion. No galaxy has a special viewpoint. So when you look at figure 14.5, you see the edge of the loaf of raisin bread, and you can identify a sensor to the loaf. The raisin bread analogy to the universe stops work working when you consider the crust, so the edge of the bread. Remember that the universe cannot have an edge or a center, so there is no center to the expansion. The raisin bread analogy is useful, but also imperfect. So when we talk about the Big Bang Theory, it's not this Big Bang Theory, but this Big Bang Theory. So now you are ready to take a historic step up the cosmology pyramid. The expansion of the universe led cosmologists to conclude that a universe must have begun with an event of unnatural intensity. Popular television shows, notwithstanding, you will learn that the Big Bang can be called a theory rather than a hypothesis because the supporting evidence supporting it is so solid and comprehensive. Imagine that you have a video of the expanding universe and run it backward. You would see the galaxies getting closer to each other. There is no center to the expansion of the universe. So you will not see galaxies approaching a single spot. Rather, you would see the spaces between galaxies shrinking and the distances between all galaxies decreasing. Eventually, as your video ran further back, galaxies would begin to merge. If you ran the video far enough back, you would see the matter and energy of the universe compressed into high density, high temperature state. The expanding universe must have begun from the moment of extreme conditions that cosmologists call the Big Bang. How long ago did the universe begin? You can estimate the age of the universe with a simple calculation. If you need to drive to a city 100 miles away and you can travel 50 miles per hour, you divide distance by rate of travel and learn the travel time, and this example is two hours. In a similar fashion, to find the age of the universe, you can divide a distance between two galaxies by the speed with which they are moving away from each other and find out how much time they have taken to reach the present separation. The simple procedure gives an estimation of the age of the universe known as Hubble time. So remember in one of the previous chapters, we did the Hubble constant. So which is the same no matter which two galaxies you pick. So the details of this calculation are given in reasoning with numbers 14.1. So let's go through this. So this can be an ex another example for the test and exam that I could ask. So, reasoning of numbers, the age of the universe. So, dividing the distance to a galaxy by the apparent velocity with which it recedes gives you an estimate of the age of the universe. And the Hubble constant simplifies your task further. The Hubble constant H has the units kilometers per second per megaparsec, which is velocity divided by a distance. If you calculate one divide the Hubble constant, you have a distance divided by velocity. To finish the vision and get an age, you need to convert megaparsecs into kilometers. And then the distances will cancel out and you leave with an age in seconds. To get years, you divide by the number of seconds in a year. If you make these simple changes in units, the age of the universe in years is approximately 10 to the power 12 divided by the Hubble constant in its normal astronomical units. Kilometers per second per megaparsec. So here we have our Equations. So the estimate of the age of the universe is known as the Hubble time. For example, if the Hubble constant is 70 kilometers per second, which it is, 
that leads to an estimation age of 10 to the power 12 divided by 70 or 14 billion years. Everybody happy with that explanation? Awesome. You will find tune your estimation of the age of the universe later in this chapter. But for the moment, you can conclude that the basic observations of the universe, especially for recession of galaxies, require that expansion of the universe began about 14 billion years ago. The phrase Big Bang was invented by early critics of that theory, and the label gave a misimpression. Do not think of an edge or a center when you think of the Big Bang. It is the very common misconception that a Big Bang was an explosion and that galaxies are flying away from the location of that explosion. Instead, you should keep firmly in mind that the correct picture of the Big Bang did not occur at a single place, but filled the entire volume of the universe. A more accurate term than a Big Bang might be the Big Stretch. The matter of which you are made was part of the Big Bang, so you are inside the remains of that event. And the universe continues to expand around you. You cannot point to any particular place and say, the Big Bang occurred over there. This is brain strangling or stretching idea. But you will find more information to help you understand it better later in this chapter, when you study the nature of space and time. So it's confirmed with 70 because there was a lot of debate that it was something close. Yes, so there is still a little bit of debate. You will see in some calculations, people use 68, other people use 72, but generally it's accepted to be 70. So your instinct also is to think of the Big Bang as an event that happened long ago and can no longer be observed, like the Gettysburg Address. Amazingly, the effect of loop time makes it possible to observe the Big Bang now, directly. The look back time to the nearby galaxies is only a few million years. The look back time to more distant galaxies is a large fraction of the age of the universe. This faint galaxy is one of the most distant ever found. It has a redshift of 6.964, implying that it's 12.9 billion light years from Earth. It appears as it was only 850 million years after the Big Bang when the light began its journey towards Earth. And that is actually very amazing. Suppose you look between the distant galaxies, seeing even further away and further back in time. You should be able to detect the hot gas that filled the universe long ago, right after the Big Bang, before the first stars and galaxies formed. The Big Bang occurred everywhere, and in whatever direction you look, at great distance, you can see back to the age when the universe was filled with hot gas. So this diagram shows schematically the expansion of a small part of the universe. Although the universe is filled with galaxies, the look back time distorts what you see. Nearby you see galaxies by the greater distances. The look back time reveals the universe at earlier stages before galaxies formed. At very great distances, the Big Bang is detectable as infrared, microwave and radio energy arriving from hot gas that has filled the universe soon after the Big Bang. The radiation that comes from such a great distance has a large redshift. The most distant visible objects are faint galaxies and quasars, with redshifts around 10. In contrast, the radiation from the hot gas right after the Big Bang has redshift of about 1,100. That means the light emitted a visible and near infrared light by hot gas in the early universe arrives as Earth as far infrared microwave and radio waves. You can't see it with your eyes, but it can be detected with infrared and radio telescopes. Unlike the Gettysburg Address, the Big Bang can still be observed by the radiation it emitted. That amazing discovery is the subject of the next section. 
So this is actually quite an interesting story of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So the story of the discovery of radiation from the time of the Big Bang begins in the mid-1960s when two Bell laboratory physicists, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, were measuring the brightness of the sky at radio wavelengths. Their measurements showed a strange extra signal in the system, which they first attributed to the infrared glow from pigeon droppings inside the antenna. Perhaps they would have enjoyed scraping out the antenna more if they had known they would win the 1978 Nobel Prize in Physics for a discovery they were about to make. So here is their front of their telescope. So when the cosmic microwave background radiation was first detected in 1965, technology did not allow measurements at many wavelengths. Not until infrared and microwave detectors could be put in space was it conclusively shown that the background radiation has black body spectrum as predicted by the theory. So is everyone still following? Everyone still awake? Awesome. So when the antenna was cleaned, they again measured the radio brightness of the sky and found the low level noise was still there. The pigeons were innocent, but what was, caused, what was causing the extra signal? The explanation for the noise goes back decades earlier. In 1939, astronomers noticed the spectra of some molecules in the interstellar medium showed they were bathed in radiation from a source with a temperature of 2 to 3 Kelvin. In 1948, physicist George Gamo predicted that the gases in the universe right after the Big Bang would have been hot and should have emitted strong black body radiation. A year later, physicists of Alpha and Robert Herman pointed out the large redshifts of the Big Bang material relative to Earth would lengthen the wavelengths of the radiation into the microwave part of the spectrum. With a black body temperature, they estimated as 5 Kelvin. So in the mid-1960s, Robert Dickey, so in your electronics courses, you will learn a lot about the Dickey switch. At Princeton, concluded radiation should be just strong enough to detect with newly developed techniques. Dickey and his team began building a receiver. When Penzias and Wilson heard of Dickey's work, they recognized the mysterious extra signal they had detected as radiation from the Big Bang, the cosmic wave, cosmic microwave background radiation, and which is cool and sad at the same time. So Penzias and Wilson, that discovered this accidentally by working at Bell Labs, got the Nobel Prize in Physics for their discovery because the other uh, Nobel Prize work is the prize is given to the discovery. Whereas the George Gamow had a theory about it. And uh, Robert Dickey was also trying to detect it. So Robert Dickey and Gamow didn't receive the Nobel Prize, although it was their theory. The prize went to Penzias and Wilson because they actually discovered it. So the detection of the background radiation was tremendously exciting, but cosmologists wanted to confirm the confirmation. They predicted that the radiation should have a spectrum like black body radiation coming from very cool source. But the critical observations could not be made from the ground because Earth's atmosphere is opaque at a predicted black body peak wavelength. It was not until 1990 that satellite measurements confirmed the background radiation as exactly a back black body spectral distribution with an apparent temperature of 2.72 plus or minus 0 0.002 Kelvin, so close to the original prediction. It may seem strange that the gas of the Big Bang seems to have a temperature of just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, but recall the tremendous redshifts. Observations on Earth received radiation that has a redshift of of 1,100. That is, the wavelengths of the photons are about 1,100 times longer than when they were emitted. The gas clouds that originally emitted the photons had a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin. 
and they emitted black body radiation with a lambda max of about a thousand newtons. So Vian's law. So although that wavelength is near infrared, the gas would have also emitted enough visible light to be seen glowing orange red if there had been a human eye present at a time. So the red shift has made the wavelengths of the black ion radiation 1,100 times longer on arrival at Earth than when they were emitted. So the lambda max is now about one millionth nanometer or one millimeter. That is why that hot gas seems to be about 2.7 Kelvin, a thousand one times cooler than it actually was. The first few steps of the cosmology pyramid have not been very difficult. Simple observations of the darkness of the night sky and the redshifts of the galaxies tell you that the universe must have had a beginning. And we have seen the cosmic microwave background radiation is clear evidence of the Big Bang. That the early universe was hot and dense. Theorists can combine these observations with modern physics to add some detail to the story of how the Big Bang occurred. So can you guys tell me what is the easiest way we can detect the cosmic microwave background and where we can see it in our everyday lives? Yes, Mr. Marvel, you are correct. So for those of you that still have analog TVs and analog radios, so the static you would see between channels in old analog TVs, that white snowy picture with the sound, that is the cosmic microwave background radiation we can pick up. And that is roughly, if I'm correct, around about 21 megahertz. And if you tune your radio, and you tune the uh, get it static between your different channel, channels of the different radio stations. That is also the cosmic microwave background radiation that you can pick up because it's in the radio part of the spectrum. That's just something interesting. And it doesn't matter so where you point your antenna to, you will see that coming from all around us. So cosmologists cannot begin the history of the Big Bang at time zero, because no one understands the physics of matter and energy under such extreme conditions. But they can come surprisingly close. If you could visit a universe where it was only 10 millionth of a second old, you would find it filled with high energy photons having a temperature of well over 20 trillion Kelvin, and a density of 5 times 10 to power 20 kilograms per cubic meter, so greater than the density of the atomic nucleus. So when cosmologists say the photons have a given temperature, they mean the photons have the same spectrum as black body radiation emitted by an object of that temperature. Consequently, the photons in the early universe were gamma rays with very short wavelengths and therefore very high energy. So when cosmologists say that radiation at a certain density, they refer to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Using that equation, you can express a given amount of radiation energy per volume as it were matter of given density. So you understand why this is, is important, how we can convert between energy and matter and matter and energy. If photons have enough energy, two photons can convert into a pair of particles, a particle of normal matter and a particle of antimatter. So when an antimatter particle meets its matching particle of normal matter, for, so, for, so when an antiproton meets a normal proton, for example, the two particles annihilate each other and convert their mass into energy in the form of two gamma rays. In the early universe, the photons were gamma rays and had enough energy to produce proton-antiproton pairs or neutron-antineutron pairs. When these particles collided with their antiparticles, they converted their mass back into photons. Thus, the early universe was filled with a dynamic soup of energy, flickering from photons into particles and back again. While all this went on, the expansion of the universe caused the temperature of the radiation to drop. 
reducing the energy of the photons. So when the universe was 10 millions of a second old, its temperature had fallen to about 2 trillion Kelvin. By that time, the average density of the radiation photons was below the energy equivalent to the mass of a proton or neutron. Gamma rays could no longer produce such heavy particles. Those particles did exist, combined with the antiparticles, and quickly converted their mass into photons. It would seem that all of the protons and neutrons should have been annihilated with the antiparticles. But for some reasons that are poorly understood, the small excess of normal particles existed. For every billion protons annihilated were antiprotons, one survived with no antiparticle to destroy it. Consequently, you live in a world of normal matter, and antimatter is very rare. Although the gamma ray photons did not have enough energy when the universe was older than about 1 millionth of a second to produce any more protons or neutrons, they could still produce electrons and positrons, so anti-electrons, which are about 1,800 times less massive than protons and neutrons. That process continued until the universe was about one minute old, at which time the expansion had cooled to the point at which there were no remaining photons, with enough energy to create electron-positron pairs. Again, most of the electrons and positrons combined to form photons, and only one in a billion electrons survived. Cosmologists can calculate based on the known properties of subatomic particles and also the characteristics of the universe as a whole, the population of protons, neutrons, and electrons in our universe were produced during the first minute of its history. So now we're going to start discussing an interesting topic called nuclear synthesis. So let me just quickly look in my notes how long this section will be. Yes, so let's do nuclear synthesis in the end of this lecture. So the universal soup of hot gas and radiation continued to cool. Photons with high enough energy can break up atomic nuclei. So the formation of stable nuclei could not occur until the universe had cooled enough. By the time the universe was about two minutes old, protons and neutrons could link to form deuterium, the nucleus of a heavy hydrogen atom without being immediately broken apart. By the end of the third minute, further reactions began converting deuterium into helium. Almost no atoms heavier than helium could be built in a Big Bang because there are no stable nuclei with atomic weights 5 or 8, so in units of hydrogen atom. So nuclei of the atomic weights 5 and 8 are radioactive and decay almost instantly back into smaller nuclei. Cosmic element building during the Big Bang had to proceed step by step, like someone hopping up a flight of stairs. So the lack of stable nuclei at atomic waves, weights of 5 and 8 meant they were missing steps in the stairway, and the step-by-step -step reactions had great difficulty jumping over these gaps during the few minutes of the Big Bang. As a result, cosmologists can calculate that only a tiny amount of lithium, atomic weight 6 and 7, would have been produced during the Big Bang and no heavier elements. So here we can see the cosmic element building. During the first few minutes of the Big Bang, temperatures and densities were high, and nuclear reactions built heavier elements. Because there are no stable nuclei of atomic weights 5 or 8, the process built very few atoms heavier than helium. So by the time it was three minutes old, the universe had become so cool that almost all nuclear reactions had stopped. By the time it was 30 minutes old, the nuclear reactions had ended completely, and about 75% of the mass of the universe was in a form of protons, hydrogen nuclei. So the rest was helium nuclei. That composition, said during the first minutes of the universe, is the composition observed now for the oldest stars. Formation of elements with atomic weights greater than lithium had to wait for relatively slow cooking nuclear synthesis processes in stars. 
beginning many millions of years after the Big Bang. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are going to end it here for this evening. We will continue on with this lecture. I just need to check, we can check our timetable. I know there is a few days where the timetable changes due to the uh, holidays that we had. So, I'm just quickly looking. So, we are currently in May. So, yes, this Friday we are following a Monday timetable. So that means we will continue this lecture on Friday evening. I know Friday evening sucks to have class, but unfortunately we are dealt with this hand. So, you guys are more than welcome to log off. Have a wonderful evening. I will see you all Friday evening. Otherwise, good luck with the rest of your week. I will remain active for another minute or two if you have more questions. It's a pleasure. Uh, so, yes, a uh, question. So, sir, is the 27th house a message test or the date for the assignment? So, uh, let me just check in our study guide. So, I know something has, the test date has changed due to a class, clash, but I have announced this already a couple of months ago. So, uh, where is it? So the semester test is the 27th of May. So unfortunately, I think that is a Friday as well. And then the assignment is due the 31st of May. It is a pleasure. So if you guys have no further questions, I am also going to log off. So have a great evening, everyone. Have a great week. And I will see you all Friday evening. Good night, everyone.